imagine being a young person who does not know at what moment in their life between seizures they're going to have another seizure. Hello Homo sapiens. May I welcome you to the third part of our three-part series about the ultra-rare genetic and currently fatal epilepsy, Lefora disease. Today, Burj Minasian, a paediatric neurologist who specializes in epilepsy, neurodegenerative diseases and neurogenetic conditions, speaks about the symptoms of Lefora disease, the impacts upon the children with the diagnosis and their families actually, positive developments and tips for other clinicians when it comes to the disease. Please do only continue to listen slash watch this episode if you're feeling strong enough to hear of a heartbreaking situation which we are sharing not to upset you but to spread awareness and encourage organisations to fund research into this shocking, devastating epilepsy. I'm Burj Minassian. I'm the Chief of Pediatric Neurology here at UT Southwestern in uh, Dallas, Texas. And my research is on genetic uh, forms of epilepsy, in particular this Lafora disease. And what led you to focus on this Lafora disease? When I was uh, a trainee many years ago, uh, maybe 30 years ago, uh, I encountered these patients. And uh, as we will discuss, it's a very, very severe form of epilepsy. I don't know anyone who hasn't, uh, who has met these kids and not been affected and wanted to try to do something about it. Uh, and in my case, since my work was in uh, medicine and neurology, I basically dedicated uh, my career to try to understand uh, and solve this disease and help these patients. By career, I, I guess you mean as a clinician, but also as a researcher slash scientist as well? Yes, I'm a clinician scientist, that's correct. Are you a pediatric um, neurologist? Yes, I used to be an adult neurologist, but uh, switched to pediatrics because this disease and so many genetic forms of epilepsy begin in uh, pediatrics. And so this disease, I believe, um, does only ever affect children because the, the people with it will die early. Yes, it starts in uh, early teenage years. And unfortunately, the way things stand now, they pass away usually around 10 years after onset following a very severe course, which we can discuss. Is the disease down to a de novo mutation, i.e. it's not passed on? No, it is passed on. It's a recessively inherited disease. So it's not passed on from the parent per se, because the parents are carriers. But when two parents uh, who are carriers get married, 25% of their children will have this disease. So they both have to carry the gene? Correct. So one in four uh, children in a family on average will have it. So we've had many instances of more than one uh, patient being affected because, you know, by pure bad luck, sometimes we've had two in a family of two, which is quite horrible. Could you give us an overview of um, the disease, please? What does it involve? Let me just say that uh, I'm going to say a word on epilepsy in general and then move into this. Okay. The biggest problem in epilepsy uh, is seizures are a big problem, but that's not the biggest problem in epilepsy. The problem is the time in between. Um, imagine being a young person who does not know at what moment in their life between seizures they're going to have another seizure. Uh, a convulsion during a work interview or at school, uh, you know, with their peers or in the movie theater, etc. Um, so the impact of that is pretty hard. I've likened it to the myth of Sisyphus in Greek mythology, where Sisyphus is constantly trying to carry the rock up the mountain and be just before he reaches the rock falls uh, and he has to go back down and do it all over again. I feel a patient lives like that and in this case the rock falls on top of them, uh, on top of everything else. So, uh, you know, hope springs eternal but a patient who does not have control uh, of their epilepsy, you know, one starts losing hope and th that's very, very hard. So this is a general epilepsy. This particular disease we're talking about, <laughs> if you like, I liken it to the myth of Prometheus in Greek mythology. Uh, and I'll get there in a moment. But let me say, these kids, when they start seizing, their seizures initially can be briefly controlled, by, but quickly come out of control. And uh, there's nothing, absolutely nothing we can do right now to control these seizures. These kids are seizing 
basically the whole day, every day, for like years, until they die of a massive convulsion. Um, it starts out in previously healthy children. There's nothing wrong with these kids until the seizures start. And when they start, they start with some brief jerks, a few seizures, but all of this escalates and becomes uh, constant and continuous uh, the way I explained to you. Again, it's like Prometheus who was uh, uh, tied down on, on a mountain and the, this uh, eagle or some bird was eating his liver and uh, it, it just uh, never ended because his liver would regenerate and the uh, animal would keep eating it. Um, so unlike the standard patient, who has periods of no seizures, these kids have ever increasing, ever worsening constant seizures. So this is an ongoing status epilepticus, basically, basically their life is that? Eventually, pretty much. Um, this, the status epilepticus uh, in these kids is not convulsive status. I mean, they do have episodes of convulsive status. Uh, uh, but basically, if you and I, if I'm the patient, this conversation we're having would have been interrupted, I don't know, 15 times already. Right. And they're unable to complete their sentences. They're unable to complete eating their food. They choke on it constantly. Uh, they also have a lot of uh, visual hallucinations, which are both of an epileptic nature and of a psychotic nature. Huh. And on top of everything else, the visual hallucinations are always very scary. They, they're, they're never pleasant. Um, so it's just just a ho horrible, I, I think it's the worst disease uh, of mankind. You worked on, or are working on this with quite a few people from around the world, is that correct? Yes, yes the, again, given the severity of this, uh, we've all come together, we're one community working together. I mean, it would be ridiculous to have competitive stances in something like this. Tell us about your work over the past few decades, basically, and how far have things come in not just identifying people with this awful, awful disease, but also in terms of under well, understanding and potentially in the future treating it? On the positive side, and believe it or not, there is a positive side. This is a monogenic disease, meaning, you know, we're dealing with one uh, gene that's mutated. Actually, there's two, but each of them in independently causes the exact same disease. So basically what's wrong with these kids is one gene that's mutated. This is not like most epilepsies. Most epilepsies are polygenic complex conditions and it's kind of hard to know exactly where it's coming from and what's causing it and how to intervene. Mind you, they are much milder than this disease. So this disease is extremely severe, but easy to understand at the fundamental causation level. The cause is the one gene that's missing. Uh, the, the, these genes uh, are responsible for the metabolism of glycogen in the brain. And, you know, there's no time to go through all the details, but we've made a lot of headway in understanding exactly what's going on. So we have treatments coming in, in the horizon both at the level of the gene where we could maybe replace the missing gene or downstream, you know, uh, where the gene product does its job, we have opportunities to intervene there and, you know, correct for the missing uh, problem. Again, these kids are completely healthy before the disease starts and at the very beginning, they're fine. So we have an opportunity to save them because they are at least for a while intact. Uh, you know, unlike other forms of epilepsy, uh, some of which, you know, are severe and affect the children from the day they're born. Um, but in this case, uh, we have intact, normally developed brains, which we could potentially save. Any other clinician that, for instance, listens or watches this, um, and they are like, often, I, I can imagine, actually are quite fearful if they have a patient diagnosed with this. What would you recommend? What would you say to them in terms of finding out more and figuring out how they can potentially support and improve quality of life for these people? So I, I think it's critical to reach out to the community. So there's a community of physicians 
uh, like myself involved um and and quite a few well not quite a few a few others but the community of families is very very strong uh, and it's global through the internet they all know each other are connected to each other in the united states there's an official foundation called chelsea's hope which seems like it's serving the job for much of the rest of the world but there are also uh, specific foundations in italy and in spain and maybe a few other places, all of whom co co collaborate closely with each other. So it's a matter of finding any, any which one of them and getting into the network um, and, and basically contributing to sharing knowledge and information. Um, they do fundraising to help research uh, and uh, conferences where, you know, we update them and so on. So we're a tight knit community and it's very important to join Again, uh, given that there are treatments coming soon, uh, it's important to diagnose kids early, even diagnosed siblings who are at risk of getting the disease because they have the genetic defect or have just started having you know, mild symptoms because we want to treat these kids before the brain is uh, irretrievably damaged. A huge thank you to Burj for his candid insight into the impacts of and hopes for individuals and families ripped apart by Lephora disease. If you are interested in learning more about Lephora, do check out the charity Chelsea's Hope, and you can also find out more about Burj through toryrobinson.com.